Good evening. Welcome to the Department of Sport and Entertainment Executive Lecture Series. It will be a great evening to talk with the business of sport and entertainment. We'll have a great panel t discussion tonight followed with some Q&A from the students, hopefully. It's a fantastic time for sport and entertainment at the University of South Carolina with March Madness in full swing. Columbia was buzzing last weekend with the rounds one and two. NASCAR is in the racing season. The WTA tennis is starting soon on Daniels Island and the PGA event will soon be at Sea Pines. We are fortunate to have a panel that knows about major events, <coughs> venues, and more importantly, the impact of the quality of life that these sporting events have on the state of South Carolina. It's been my pleasure to work and to get to know each of these panelists over the years as I worked at the university. These guys are consummate professionals, more importantly, quality leaders in the sports industry. If you want to see real role models in your life, take a look at this stage tonight. I would like to acknowledge a few of our guests tonight, our associate dean and the dean of our college, Dean O, is here. Um, I think Dr. Cardenas is here. I'd like to say thank you to the faculty, Dr. Brown, um, Dr. Southall, um, Professor, um, and Dr. Morrison, I know, is going to be coming soon. And Dr. Grady, thank you very much for showing up. And a special thank you to Kim Boone and Jess for all your work you've done for organizing the students for this event. And especially for our featured guests tonight, thank you very much. I'd like to take a few minutes to share how this lecture series came about and the purpose for this lecture. Jim Hunter started the first NASCAR marketing class at the University of South Carolina when he was present at Darlington Raceway. Mr. Hunter wanted SPTE at the University of South Carolina to have the real first NASCAR marketing class. He came into my office and asked, can I do this? And of course, I was smart enough to say yes. It has been a great success and the class is still going today. In fact, it's one of the most popular electives that we have. After a few years, Darlington and NASCAR funded the lecture series. Since that time, we've been very fortunate to have Jim Hunter, George Pine, the president of IMG Sport and Entertainment, Steve Bashotti, the owner of the Ravens, the SEC commissioners, Sankey, Slive, and Kramer have been here, Lisa France Kennedy out of ISC, Mike Helton, the president of NASCAR, Joey Chitwood, and Dr. Danny Morrison with the Panthers, Ron Shapiro came out of there, and P Peter Luco with Oakview Group has been here. And it continues tonight with the true leaders of South Carolina sports world. The purpose of this executive lecture series is to bring sport and entertainment executives to the campus, the university, and to the Carolina community. Our mission is to teach and assist you in your careers. Tonight, please listen and learn. You never know who, what can create a passion in your life, and what can assist you in your career. You have the opportunity to enjoy your career. I hope it's in the sport and entertainment business. Find that passion and work hard to attain your goals. Now I'd like to introduce Grace Smith, a master's student in the Department of Sport and Entertainment and happens to be a fantastic representative of SPTE in our master's program. She comes right here from Columbia, South Carolina. Grace. It is my pleasure to introduce the tournament director of the Volvo Car Open, Mr. Bob Moran. A graduate of Elon University, he has gone on to lead one of tennis's greatest events. Under his leadership, the Family Circle Tennis Center has hosted concerts for Sugarland, Don Henley, and a local favorite, Darius Rucker, among many others. International tennis stars will flood the Low Country this week to play in the Volvo Car Open. Described as a tennis legacy, the Volvo Car Open has grown in size and prestige since moving to Daniel Island in 2001. Because it's not a required event on tour, the consistent group of elite players who return year after year is a credit to the ca high caliber event that Mr. Moran is able to consistently deliver. This year's event is filled with household names like Sloan Stevens, Caroline Wozniacki, and Madison Keys, among many others. We appreciate his willingness to come share some time with us, especially four days before the 2019 Volvo Car Open kicks off. Please help me welcome Mr. Bob Moran. Thank you, Grace. Did you wake up? That was very good. Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Clark Benassi, and I am a first-year graduate student here in University of South Carolina's Sport and Entertainment Management Program. The speaker I have the pleasure of introducing to you all tonight is Mr. Kerry Tharp, current and 10th president of Darlington Raceway. Mr. Tharp is responsible for overseeing all day-to-day -day track operations for the track Too Tough to Tame, and previously served as NASCAR's Senior Director of Racing Communications for 12 years, in which he handled numerous efforts, including but not limited to communication, rules and regulations, as well as media outreach. Since joining Darlington, Kerry has implemented a unique retro-focused throwback marketing strategy at the Raceway. Before joining NASCAR, he worked 26 years in intercollegiate athletics, serving in a variety of administrative and director roles, including a 20-year stint as associate AD for media relations for the great University of South Carolina. Kerry is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, and received his bachelor's degree in PR from Western Kentucky University, along with a master's degree in communications from the University of Tennessee. Please give your gracious thanks and undivided attention to a gentleman I've been lucky enough to hear speak previously in my classroom, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kerry Tharp. Hello, everyone. My name is Elijah Teague, and I'm currently an undergraduate student here in the Sport and Entertainment Management Program. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Mr. Steve Wilmot. Mr. Wilmot is currently the director of the RBC Heritage Golf Tournament that is held in Hilton Head, South Carolina. And he's also the president of the Heritage Classic Foundation, which has donated over $38 million to help people in need. He's served in these two roles for 22 years, and that time has helped grow the event to one of the premier tournaments here in the United States. He has also recently been named as the next chairman of the PGA Tours Tournament Advisory Committee, and we are very grateful that he's here with us tonight. So please help me welcome Mr. Steve Wilmot. My name is Gianna Messina, and I'm a senior in the undergraduate program at Sport and Entertainment Management. The moderator for this panel is Mr. Dwayne Parrish. Mr. Parrish currently works as the director of the South Carolina Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. He has dedicated more than 40 years of his professional career to the hospitality industry, including extensive experience in the hotel property management and development throughout South Carolina. Mr. Parrish was first appointed to his current cabinet position by former Governor Nikki Haley in 2011 and was reappointed by current Governor Henry McMaster in 2018. As director, he has led South Carolina's tourism industry through positive development, resulting in the past six consecutive years of record-breaking economic growth. Thanks to Mr. Parrish, South Carolina State Parks has achieved an unprecedented 99% operational self-sufficiency. Mr. Parrish has served as an adjunct professor at the College of Charleston and Trident Technical College, teaching um, hotel management. He was a former chairman and active member of the South Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association, serves on the board of directors for the U.S. Travel Association, and is the vice chair of the National Council of Tourism, State Tourism Directors. His greatest accomplishment was his son, Preston, who graduated from our Sport and Entertainment Management Master's program. Thank you for coming to Dr. Regan's Executive Lecture Series. And without further ado, Mr. Parrish will start us off. Welcome, everyone. I think Dr. Regan threw that in there about my son Preston. My greatest <coughs> accomplishment, but I'm, I'm sure Preston would be glad to hear that. But uh, um, yep, and I said, told Preston, my son, who was doing tonight, and he said, "Well, tell Dr. Regan." I said, "Hello." He uh, he loved being here, and he's still in the business. He is a swimming coach at the YMCA in Rock Hill. So I thought I'd start off tonight with a, just a couple of quick statistics about tourism, a little bit about some sports tourism, then we'll get into here what you're really here for is from these guys. So economic impact of tourism in 2017, $22.6 billion in economic impact for our state. By some measures, the largest industry in the state, certainly in the top two to three. Um, $15.2 billion in domestic visitor spending. That's a lot of money spent in our state on tourism. Tourism accounts for one in 10 jobs, and it accounts for 1.1 billion in capital investment in tourism in the last um, seven years. 
with that, I'll sort of break down a little bit of golf. We track golf on an annual basis. Um, I'll talk a little bit about golf. Um, we don't have it for tennis and for, for NASCAR, but I can tell you um, they're big parts of what we do in this state. So golf has an economic impact of $2.7 billion and accounts for over 33,000 jobs and $881 million in personal income in South Carolina. These are big numbers, I can assure you. Um, so a little bit beside me here, Darlington opened 1950. The Heritage Golf Tournament started in 1969, and the Volvo Car, <coughs> car Open started in 1973. And these three events are the largest annual recurring events in terms of economic impact for our state. So it really is an honor and a pleasure to be here with these three people on the stage. So with that, I'll start it off. And speaking of golf, I'll start with you, Steve. So each of these events has a long legacy, as you just heard from the years I gave you, as South Carolina sporting events. Um, so I want to ask, how has your event changed over the years? And what are some of the opportunities that, that exist today that really weren't available in the early decades um, to your, of your tournament? And what are the challenges you face as, sport, as tourism continues to, sports tourism, con tourism continues to evolve around the heritage? It was a lot of questions. Yeah. So, you can take them one at a time. So, how's, this cha how's it changed? So, we'll start with that one. First and foremost, thank you for having us here tonight, too. And I can speak on everyone's behalf, too. I appreciate We appreciate all the support that we get from the university and certainly from the state of South Carolina as well. But uh, um, I've been known to answer questions after, eventually somewhere down the road after question, other questions. But, uh, but I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest changes we certainly see are the challenges that we have, too, is... Um, you know, certainly keeping up with uh, the sponsorships, additional opportunities and all. And uh, um, we all have incredible events. We all have uh, continued to try to strive to do things differently. And you can't do, because you did it away five years ago, might have been right, let alone last year it might have been, but doesn't mean it's right now. So uh, we continue to look at ways to do things better continue to look at challenges of how we did things and should we even continue to do those. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts with this. I think that, that the question and all too, but uh, uh, the event's gotten bigger. It's a, it, it's a, the economic impact is tremendous. The week of the event of close to $100 million as well to the state of South Carolina. And uh, we have to keep on being in the forefront of um, you know, putting our best foot forward, uh, creating special activities around a special event. Over the past several decades. Well, I can tell you from a NASCAR perspective, uh, no longer can you just say we're having a race this weekend and wait for the phones to ring. Okay, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I first got into NASCAR, uh, I think I think the sport could do that. Uh, but at Darlington, I think we're blessed because we have a unique uh, story to tell. Uh, we're the second oldest racetrack in NASCAR. And uh, we put on a, a Labor Day event. Uh, well, let me back up a second. We lost our Labor Day date uh, several years ago. And, and so that was very, very challenging and difficult for our track and for our fans. We got that date back about five years ago. And so then we implemented the throwback weekend. And for us to be the official throwback weekend of NASCAR is very, very special. I can't think of another sports property or another sport entity that is the official anything of, of that particular sport. And so that has allowed us to be relevant 12 months a year and uh, not just one race weekend. And, and, uh, but, you know, you have to stay at it. As Steve mentioned, uh, it, it's, it's a lot different than it first was uh, when we all got into the, to the sport. Uh, there are so many other things for people to do now. There are so many other ways for them to consume content. Um, and, and, you know, when I, was a, when I was a student, you know, nobody even knew what a cell phone was, okay, much less a computer. Uh, those, that technology has changed the way that we do business and the way that we communicate with our fans. Uh, and, and so I think we're just really just on the cutting edge. It changes drastically. But I really think that you have to, you have to be very, very smart. Uh, you have to create a brand. And thankfully at Darlington, we have that brand of being the official throwback weekend of NASCAR. And then you just, you get out amongst the, 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 the fans and, and continually, uh, you know, preach that message to them and uh, get them excited, get them to come to your event. There's nothing like going to a sporting event in person. 
You can stay at home, you can watch it on the big screen, you can watch it on your phone, but until you go to the Heritage or you go down to the uh, uh, tournament at Daniel Island or if you come to Darlington, it is unbelievable when you go in person. So, you know, we have to get our fans to make sure that they experience it in person. Very good. Bob, changes yeah, I, from I'm going to echo a lot of the same thoughts, but, uh, you know, I think we all spend more time what happens off the golf course, off the racetrack, and off the courts. We're, we all know what that product looks like and is. Uh, so we spend more time on all the other special events, what our restaurant and dining experience is, what, uh, what music experience we're all bringing to the table. Um, all of those things that go into the fan experience. I think all of us will, will say that. Um, also, I think we'll all say our prize money all went dramatically up since the beginning from, uh, from <laughs> yeah, a long time point. ago. No question. Um, and then immediate, you know, from, from us just five years ago when we had seven hours of coverage, we're up to 60 hours of coverage, and that's just domestically. And we have you know, 120 hours internationally with 165 different countries just for tennis. And I know uh, Steve's in the same place with, with golf. Um, so, yeah, we spend more time outside the lines and we spend a lot of time thinking about how we make that experience for fans, for the players and the drivers and the players who are participating. How do we make that experience better? Because um, we all compete to make sure we're getting the best that we can get. Um, and how do we handle the growth that's coming along with that? Let's talk about technology for just a minute. And Kerry, you touched on it. So tell me specifically, how do you engage your fans, um, both before the event and during the event for their experience? And what ways in terms of technology, obviously the smartphone today that wasn't here 20 years ago, but beyond that, what do you do to engage those fans? And Bob, I'll start with you on this. Sure. No, I'm, I expect everyone who walks out of this room to download our Volvo Car Open app, just <laughs> yeah. so you can keep up the <laughs> speed go. with what's coming down. Um, we've invested more and more in that app. Well, we did it last year. It was our first year of having our own um, and kind of learned some really good lessons from that. And then basically, how do we make it better? How do we make it more comprehensive? Uh, we want people to be able to go right to their phone and be able to find out everything they need to know about our event. Uh, any of our box holders can now order in-seat food service that no other tennis event's doing, I can tell you that, where they can stay in their seats and have the food brought to you, drinks brought to you. Anything, again, that is driven by technology that's making the fan experience better, we're really focusing a lot of energy. Kerry, you well, touched cer on this. Certainly at, at Darlington, uh, believe it or not, we do have social media at Darlington. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I tell people uh, uh, all the time that, uh, you know, our, our track is kind of like the uh, Wrigley Field of, of NASCAR, okay? We're not the prettiest place. We're certainly not the fanciest place, but I think we're the coolest track out there. But we have also learned over the last several years that people communicate and receive communications in much different manners. Uh, no longer do you just send out a piece of mail asking somebody to buy tickets. And really, email has become somewhat antiquated and so really over the past two years uh, Dwayne we've we've really got into the social and digital uh, marketing uh, ploy of contacting our customers and our fans through their various social media uh, platforms whether it be Twitter Instagram or Facebook we found that if you if you hit them on those apps or those platforms they are more uh, inclined to to pay attention uh, and, and, you know, possibly make a purchase. Uh, an example, uh, we had a very modest spend of $2,000 back about six weeks ago uh, when our renewals uh, uh, had just launched. And you're able to track, uh, uh, you know, what the, what the success rate is of these, uh, uh, of the social media on, on, on the purchase uh, side of things. And so we tracked that there were 158 ticket orders based upon the social media, which translated into almost $50,000 of, of, of ticket revenue. And so that is where, you know, we are really focusing our efforts now, particularly when it comes to reaching our consumers. Um, as Bob mentioned, you, you have to be, uh, you have to be relevant, at, you know, the race weekend, uh, uh, you have to be relevant. And that's probably an area where NASCAR is, I'll be honest with you, is a little behind the rest of the professional sports uh, at their facilities, but they're making great gains uh, on that. Uh, but to be able to, to download the, the videos, uh, you know, NASCAR has so much technology uh, that we are just now getting on the mobile apps. Uh, 
whether it be in-car cameras or, or those types of things. And so I, I really think that we're just kind of on the cutting edge when it comes to that. But uh, I think there's a lot of exciting times ahead when it, in regards to that. Steve? Ditto, ditto. And the, interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing is, too, here, here you talk about maybe a little bit old school with some things, mm -hmm. too, but here five years ago, uh, the, our, the PGA Tour wouldn't even allow a phone. Now, all of a sudden, they didn't even have a social media department. Now they have a, a department of 40-plus employees mm -hmm. down there. So um, it was interesting how that whole dynamic's changed. And what, um, what Bob was saying, too, about the fact anybody can watch, and Kerry, too, anybody can watch golf, racing, tennis, any day of the week, basically, mm -hmm. or through the weekend. So what we're trying to sell is that once you get there and the experience itself of being there, but also um, the fact of what added value, what can you add to the experience that they can't get watching on TV? And you're obviously wanting them to experience it, uh, creating some, some things differently, so that they'll go back and they'll tell the neighbors, geez, you gotta go, it's not just a golf tournament. You know, and that's that's one of the things that we've experienced over the years too. The number one selling T-shirt in Harbor Town is who invited these golfers to our party. You know, <laughs> so, but to take it, it and Kerry knows I'm I'm a bit of old school, and it's about the communication side. But here I am working with our agency a couple of years ago, and they're telling me how they're going to advertise on Pandora this year. I'm like, how the heck do you advertise on a bracelet? You know, so, <laughs> I, so I'm kind of it's it is. <laughs> It has changed dramatically that, that it's something that we need to. This year, Facebook, virtual reality, mm -hmm. all the things that we've talked about from uh, Instagram uh, or Snapshot, uh, everything that we just mentioned. Snapchat. Here. Snapchat. Snapchat. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the sharpest guy either. So I told you that before. But, Pan Pandora's a music service, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I learned that. But, but we have to obviously continue to, yes, we have golf event, everything mentioned, inside the ropes, inside the track, inside the courts, we're all about trying to enhance the experience outside of those venues. Sure. Dwayne, re real quick, just to sure. add on, because it's an interesting phenomenon that's happening now is, um, I sat through a couple of rights agreements, media rights, so um, the traditional companies, CBS, ABC, ESPN, NBC, who bid on rights, no matter what sport uh, that you're talking about. The latest players who are, are making a big pitch are Amazon, Facebook, and Twitter who are now buying up media rights at high prices. And the interesting piece, what um, Amazon pitched was, listen, we have multi-millions of people who are on Amazon, subscribers, what have you, Amazon Prime, and we say that if someone buys a pair of tennis shoes, that they'll automatically get a push out about our broadcast and about your tennis event. And they're, 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 that's kind of scary in a, in a little bit, but that's little where bit. things are going. When those players are starting now to engage in media rights and where they see the value is, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon where that's going. Interesting. Yeah, a little bit of big brother on the yes. watching, but at the same time you can use it to your advantage to mm -hmm. engage your fans and potential fans. All right. So talk a little bit about what other things you do to keep your fans engaged 365 days a year. So other events or side events or PR events or things that you do year-round on a somewhat year-round basis to try to keep people engaged and excited so when ticket time comes around, they're, they're already top of mind in regard to that. So, Carrie, I'll sort of start with you. Some of the other things you do at Darlington. Sure. We, uh, we try to make sure that people in the, uh, in the area, which we call the PD uh, region there in the, in, in the area in which I live, um, understand that this is their racetrack, okay? Um, our event, our Labor Day event, encompasses about four days, okay? So that other 360 days, we have to make sure that uh, there are things going on. And so we open up our track to a wide variety of, uh, of outside entities. Uh, we've had camping there with Boy Scouts. Uh, we've had uh, 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 car shows, uh, classic car shows. We had a classic car show there last spring uh, from actually people all over the, the country. It's a hot rod association. We had about 4,500 cars uh, came on property, and they brought about nine or 10,000 people with them. And they were there for four days. We have barbecue festivals. Uh, we have a 4th of July concert uh, there in, in, in concert with the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, there in the, in the particular area. And we have a lot of track rentals, too. Uh, and I tell this when I go out and speak to businesses, whether it's Sunoco in Hartsville or Nucor there in Darlington or even Boeing down in Charleston. You know, where can you go and have a manager's meeting 
and then go out and get in a pace car and go 110 miles an hour. <laughs> now, a lot of them don't want to do that, but uh, that, you know, we do offer those types of things. We, in fact, we just finished up with a two-day uh, Nucor Steel, which is a big uh, employer there in, in Darlington and Florence, just had their managers meeting uh, on our property and had about 50 or 60 people there, and we did a lot of things with them. Uh, with uh, with uh, pace car rides and those types of things and so we do a lot of things with the school district the, the kids come out uh, take field trips we have a museum that's connected to our racetrack a uh, 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 national motorsports media association museum so you know we do as much as we can to to include the community in in our in our in our race uh, 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 in our track uh, and so uh, you know to try to make sure that they know that hey this is their track too, and it's not just open, you know, that Labor Day weekend. Perfect. So, Steve, tell a little bit about Congressional Cup and some of the other things you do, Players Championship, other parts of the year to sort of keep people engaged. Well, we are a little different. We're, we uh, rent the facility to be in Harbor Town, so we are a 501c3, a non for profit organization, so that we all spend with our events 53 weeks out of the year, if not team third if not 13 months out of the year <laughs> yeah. on the event, sure. truly. So, but, uh, um, but we do have an amateur event that we engage um, the top amateur in the, uh, one of the premier amateur events in the country uh, that we host. And the winner of that event does receive an e exemption into the, uh, the RBC Heritage presented by Boeing. And that, that is a tie for us to working with the next generation of players. Uh, I kid around, and you've heard me say this before, that during the Heritage, I lose 10 to the 15 pounds yeah, during the players it. am I gained 10 to 15 pounds <laughs> because I have an opportunity to sit with these players at lunch at 11 o'clock unfortunately I go and sit with some other guys at one o'clock with the <laughs> players am but uh, but we're our, our mission is giving back um, as we all are engaged in the charitable component of it so our messaging throughout the course of the year is tying things into uh, all the efforts of us giving back the Congressional Cup is an event that we actually host uh, uh, that Senator Lindsey Graham hosts um, on Hilton Head, but it's a way for us to uh, have businesses there, not to rub elbows with myself or our, our team, but to get to know the con uh, our, uh, congressional delegation, but then also to uh, bring in companies that we're able to um, potentially show the event and things too. So, but it's the charity side. It's, 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 it's the fact that give back, it's their scholarships. It's a, uh, um, you know, it's the, it's, it's, it's actually the second helping. It's a lot of different uh, events that we do, and that's how we message the tournament. It is one week out of the year, but truly, it's a year-round effort. Sure. Well, there's so many other competitors for the, for the you know the discretionary dollar these days. I know it's tough to keep them engaged. Bob, talk a little bit about the other things you do year-round at the. Uh, sure. So, the, at well, the kind of twofold. With, with tennis, you know, social media has made it uh, made it much easier to keep our fans up to date on what our players are doing. We we. Women's tennis, we need to build a fan base. We're going to continually build a fan base. We gotta, we've got to be able to tell the stories of the rising stars and the next players. So as soon as our tournament's over this year, uh, we may have a great winner, and we're going to tell that story to our fans throughout the rest of the year. How do they do it in French Open and Wimbledon? Um, and we do that throughout our field and throughout the year. And again, our Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram and everything that we utilize can help us tell those stories and keep our fans engaged on a year-round basis. Say this, the second part of that story, yeah, we have a facility that we need to use. My partners uh, from AEG are here who uh, help us book our, our concert venue. Uh, it's getting a little tight this year, so they may not be real happy with us. We're, we finished the tournament on April 7th. We got Dave Matthews on April 20th. So tear down the facility from tennis and build a stage and put everything on uh, April 20th. But it's how do we fully utilize the facility the best we can. So with concerts, and, and through the years, we've done beach volleyball, 80 dump trucks of sand in the facility. That was Almost, uh, I lost all my, my whole staff almost lost, walked out on me after that. <laughs> uh, we've done multiple other tennis events throughout the year to, to, to become, you know, to stay relevant in what we do. Um, so it's programming as far as the facility itself. And then with, with tennis, it's building a fan base and building stories that last throughout the year. Typically, how many concerts a year do you take place at your facility? Uh, Chris, we're going to do 25 this year? No. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, no, we'd like, we'd like to do in the, in the 14 to 15 range. You know, Super. It varies each year. Um, switching a little bit to the actual tournament itself, talk a little bit about what volunteers mean to your tournament or to your uh, event, what they mean, what their role is, how you engage them, how you find them, and what they mean to your event. So I'll start with you, Steve, with the heritage. Well, 
certainly we, we sit here and we talk about last year being a, celebrating our 50 was a banner year and we were able to give back in excess of $3 million to, to charity. But if we had to pay our volunteers a dollar an hour <laughs> for their time, we would give nothing back to charity. Sure. So they play an integral part in so many different aspects of, of the event. Uh, we have, when you look at our tournaments, it, we have roughly 1,200 volunteers that support the tournament that run work directly for us. But when you get into parking of cars and uh, the concessions and um, ecology and all, we have over 2,500 volunteers that support the event. And as, as Carrie was saying too, is the event at Hilton Head, we don't, we here in South Carolina, we don't com truly compete with the NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA, and also we are, and I've referenced this many times, that we are the big three here in South mm -hmm. Carolina, which we're honored to be a part of that and be able to showcase. But uh, Hilton Head Island, we're, we're a, a small market. Uh, we can't go east, <laughs> northeast or west to, to market the event. So we, we look at it, it's truly South Carolina's tournament. And that's how, uh, when we went through our little hiccup a few years ago, looking at a partner, uh, we were we were trying to figure out ways to save for South Carolina. We have two wonderful partners in ABC or um, RBC, <laughs> RBC and, uh, and 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 Boeing, but um, but it's it's uh, it's a community event. It's the South Carolina event, and that's the rallying cry. It's always when it comes to even reaching out to the state or reaching out to our government officials. In the, in the community, yes is the answer, what's the question? You know, this is a great opportunity to be able to showcase uh, uh, our community, but South Carolina to the world. Super. So. Gary, volunteers for the dog. Well, we, we are blessed to have a, a great uh, relationship, obviously, here with the university, and uh, there are, I've already talked to several students here tonight uh, that were uh, work our race weekend. A young lady here on the front row uh, uh, said she didn't really ever see a car, but uh, she, she saw plenty of uh, people that looked like they were having a good time. But uh, no, Dr. Reagan and, and Brad and, and now Dr. O, they have been just terrific in, in helping uh, us uh, with, with ushers, people working the concessions, uh, you know, doing everything that, that's necessary uh, to, to put on an event like that when you're going to have upwards of 70,000 people on your property for four days. Uh, you know, you better have it organized and you, you, you need a small army of people out there. So we are very, very thankful uh, and we're very, very uh, reliant on, on the students uh, here at the university. And, and uh, you know, we think it's a, not only great for us, but we think it's a good opportunity for them uh, to, to, you know, come to a, a big time sporting event. And, uh, you know, the, the, the relationship we have with the uh, NASCAR marketing class is, is really, really neat. In fact, they're coming to the track on, on Saturday. Uh, they're taking a little field trip on, on Saturday, so we look forward to that. So uh, I, I'd say the bulk of our volunteers uh, are our university students. Uh, and, you know, we get some, obviously, around the community, but uh, and, and, the, and the law enforcement and the people, we security people, we have to come in. Um, you know, we have to pay some of those. And State Highway Patrol is unbelievable. Uh, they do such a good job as does SLED. Uh, so, you know, it takes a, it takes a small army of people uh, when you bring in all these folks from out of town and all over the country and all over the world. Um, and, 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 but we're very, very blessed to have the relationship we do here with, uh, with Carolina. Volunteers as a family. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Yeah, watch it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's absolutely the, the, the same <laughs> message. Uh, uh, we kind of we, we threw that at you earlier. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Um, You know, we have uh, over 400 volunteers, and we we definitely could not do the event without them. Um, and it's their event, and they're our front line, and they're the folks that are seeing our ticket holders right from the beginning. Um, my ticket, uh, I'm sorry, my volunteer coordinator does a great job every year of. As, as Steve was saying, referencing earlier, of giving me an hour, per hour cost what that volunteer would cost me. Mm. And it's a great reminder of what they do mean to us because sure. it's very, it's significant. Um, but what's important to us is to make them feel like they are our family and that this is their event. And uh, I am proud of the group that, uh, that, that supports us every year. Um, and we also, like Kerry was saying, we have a great group from South Carolina. We've known Dr. Reagan for I personally for 19 years, and uh, it's always been a great relationship with the University of South Carolina and the students that come help us. And I, I do believe it's a great opportunity to kind of see everything that we go through. Probably don't see a lot of tennis. I'm sorry about that. Don't see a lot of race cars. Probably don't see a lot of golf. Uh, but that's part of this business. Uh, it's the working and the behind the scenes. So very, very blessed to have, have USC as part of our team.
just just one sure. thing with both both comments here is you know we we talk about volunteers, but we, we look at we have a year round uh, group of interns that throughout the course of the year, and we 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 look them as interns when they start the first of the year, but within a month they become part time employees. Uh, um, you know we just don't have people that should hey I like ESPN and um, I like sports and watch ESPN. It's truly we have a two that are working in our ticket office, two working in marketing and sales, we have two operations right now, and they become, they fully entrench and are, are an integral part of the success of the event every year too. So the, it, we look at volunteers, but we also look at the interns as um, a, a great opportunity to get, get engaged in so many different aspects of our business. It's not one thing, it's something different every, every, every minute. Yeah, I'm not sure the public realizes the extent to which how many volunteers and how many hours they put in to take on an event such as this. Let's talk about another group, in terms of like sponsors, for, um, and how that's changed over decades. So sponsors, um, I think traditionally um, in the past and, e and even um, today publicly think, well, they pay to get their name on something. But it's a lot more than that. They use the venue for entertainment. They use it for, <coughs> in the case of RBC, to do even sustainable green things. And so talk a little bit about how sponsorship has changed, particularly today, and what they do at the event itself versus just having their name on it. Well, I mean, the, the branding part, it's interesting, and, and Bob touched on the television side of it, too, and who has the TV time and the rights and all, too. So the, the sponsorships are all-encompassing. and uh, um, But they look at, you know, the, these partners. Um, we are somewhat unique, again, too, is that we have a – just like when we were going through our hiccup a few years ago, there was discussions of we all these part all these businesses we were engaged with were like you have a great b backyard being Hilton Head Island along the coast, but we we had no businesses in that area, so we are a destination event. Um, so um, the n majority of our sponsors are bringing in partners from all over the the world, ironically, and uh, um, so the, somewhat of the challenge too is for the sec sake of us we're not selling just our community in South Carolina we're trying to bring these um, sponsors in but they're all looking for um, they're all looking for obviously two things the branding is certainly one but then fortunately for us too is the the client entertainment and the customer um, experience as well and uh, you know it was interesting and I'll tell the story because it, it connects with South Carolina too the first year we the first meeting we had <coughs> with Boeing uh, when they were in an operations meeting and they were talking to us about, you know, uh, they had a couple questions of, uh, logistically about the airport. And we mentioned to them that you know, there's some limitations on Hilton Head's airport, uh, the length of the runway, and they said something about trees. And they looked at me going, Steve, just to let you know, our customers were bringing in their private planes are 747s, yeah, or 727s. So we're like, they ain't landed on Hilton Head, so uh, um, so so we all have. They're all looking for something different, but that's where we are. We're, we sit and listen to hear what they're looking for, and then try to create something around what they're they're, they're wanting. While we're on this tool sponsorship, Steve, to you as well, talk a little bit about how you had a telecommunication company for decades, and then all of a sudden in 2010 it sort of went away, and then. How you sort of relook at things, the world sort of changed in 2009, and how you went from that to where you, what you have with RBC and Boeing today, and getting through that time period. Well, I, I, just like I'm going to learn something tonight from these gentlemen right here and yourself too. You learn each and every day, and the day you stop learning is the day you get out of business. Not that I hope to be around another 30 pounds, but that's another <laughs> story. But uh, the 30 years or so. But uh, um, but what what happened? We learned a lot about ourselves. Uh, we were. We were very successful at Heritage Classic Foundation, and all of a sudden we realized there's things that we need to do differently. Uh, we know the challenges. Uh, uh, what happened, fortunately for us, we had uh, a very engaged, um, our former governor, uh, Nikki Haley, that was uh, uh, very instrumental in, in, in bringing uh, RBC in. We had Senator Lindsey Graham that was like, uh, very instrumental in having Boeing as a partner as well, too. And the tour was telling us all along the fact that you know, you want one sponsor, you want one sponsor, you want one sponsor, and I, <laughs> I'm looking at it from the standpoint, two's better than none, yeah. so how do we, and uh, uh, there, there are some challenges with, with that, um, but also they both complement one another, and uh, again, you can't sit back and just do business like you used to, and there's nothing that I and our team I, I dislike hearing is like, well, we did it that way last year. You have to look at it as how can you do it better, 
should we do it at all? Is there a different way of doing it? And that was through that hiccup we learned a lot about we need to keep on keeping on so we can do better to be better so we can get better. So, Bob, a little bit of sponsorship. So you, you name has changed from Family Circle, obviously, the Volvo cars. Talk a little bit about I think I think what's what's definitely changed on the sponsorship side. I'd, I'd say the good news for all of us here is that with current marketing, everyone marketing teams will say, "Oh, we got to do social, and we got to do we got to do all these things." And you're like, "Okay, so why?" But no one knew why. But we knew we had to do social. Um, I'd say the good news for us is that there's so much social, so much messaging coming to consumers right now that the value of in-person opportunities is now going back up. So companies want to be able to see someone in person now. Um, where that kind of shifted away for a little bit, it's starting to shift back. So what, what does that say to us? We've got to be able to create those experiences. And it's not with the sponsors just sitting behind a table and handing out something. They've got to do something that engages the customer, be it in Volvo's case, ride and drives. Um, they know if they get a, you know, a person in the seat of a car, chances of selling that car go up dramatically. Um, and that's true with all of our partners. They need to engage. They're looking for us to show them how to engage um, the consumers. And we, I think we do a great job of creating those scenarios where our partners are engaging the consumers and therefore selling more product or getting more information out there or getting their message out there. So it's, it's a constant to Steve's point. How do we do it better? How are we staying top of mind? And how are we uh, looking towards what the next five to 10 years look like in, the, in that sponsorship space? Gary, talk a little bit about sponsorships in regard to Darlington and, of course, Bojangles has come along after Showtime and how that's sort of evolved over the years. Right. We're, we're really blessed, I think, at Darlington uh, for our cup race to have Bojangles. Uh, and, you know, how, how, how throwback can you get? Bojangles <laughs> and Darlington go together like peanut butter and jelly, I think. <laughs> and, and it's just a terrific partnership that we have with them. Um, you know, they have almost 600 stores, but like 65% of those stores are in the Carolinas. Uh, so they just brought in a new CEO, uh, and their company just got sold about six months ago. So, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an evolving process. Uh, they are very, very uh, in sync with Darlington, but they are also wanting to make sure that the Bojangles brand uh, is front and center uh, within our, our, you know, with Darlington and within NASCAR 12 months a year. And so that's very, very important to them, especially to the new leadership that they have there now. And, and so uh, they have been a, a, a terrific partner of ours. Uh, they're involved with, with a lot of sports partnerships, uh, the Charlotte Hornets, the Panthers, Charlotte Motor Speedway, the Atlanta Coast Conference, among others. But I can tell you in all uh, honesty and certainty, they value our sponsorship at the very, very top. And so it's, it's very important that we, uh, we treat that with respect and that we're smart about it, uh, we're aggressive with it, and we, we do everything we can to make sure that that Bojangles brand is just not talked about that four or five days when they come to Darlington. And for our Xfinity race, uh, we're blessed to have sport clips. And while their headquarters is in Georgetown, Texas, which is right outside of Austin, their founder and CEO, Gordon Logan, is from Sumter, South Carolina. And he loves Darlington. And he loves NASCAR. And uh, so, uh, you know, we've got a great uh, relationship and partnership with them. But, you know, they have 900 stores in every state in the union and in Canada. And so, you know, I went out, flew out, and, and met with them uh, for a day back in December. And, you know, they, they, they want to know what we can do to make sure that those stores in Idaho know about what their relationship is with Darlington. And so, you know, we do as much as we can, whether it be socially or just doing some things with uh, some of our, you know, some of the drivers in the sport. You know, they sponsor a car for Joe Gibbs Racing uh, for about six races a year. They were on Eric Jones' car at the Daytona 500. And so... You're blessed to have these partnerships, but yet, you know, there's so much other competition out there that you have to be smart and you have to be ahead of the game. One thing that NASCAR is, is, is going to be looking at in 2020, you know, for years they had a one single sponsor in their Cup Series. It was Winston, uh, then it was Nextel, then Sprint, and for the past couple of years it's been Monster Energy. And so NASCAR is looking at a multi-level sponsorship for their premier series. 
And uh, I think that's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, um, you know, some people say it's like the Olympic model, uh, which it, 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 there is some similarities. But, you know, what NASCAR is looking at is probably four, maybe five, what you would call premier partners, and then go down to another level, which I think would be like a platinum partner. And, and, and there'd be several levels of sponsorship uh, that, that, that corporations could have in our sport. And so that's going to change a, a, a large dynamic in, in how we do business. And so um, it's, as both Steve and Bob mentioned, it's, it's, uh, it's very competitive. Uh, it's, you know, you, you have to have personal relationships uh, with these folks uh, in, in order for those sponsorships to, 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 ma to be maintained because they have a lot of choices out there and they have, a lot of them have stockholders that they have to answer to. And, and so it's, uh, it's uh, something that, you know, sometimes it's a little challenging to navigate. Okay. You're each part of a national organization, the PGA, NASCAR, and the WTA. Tell me what that <coughs> means to you, what they, help, what they help you with, how they're a benefit to you, and what that, um, but also what that requires of you at the local level, in addition to how they help you on the national level, what that means to you. Bob, we'll start with you. Uh, so with the WTA, the Women's Tennis Association, you know, they're, they're managing the tour on a year-round basis, the relationships with the players. I think where we're different than PGA Tour on the, on the WTA Tour, <coughs> the players in the tournaments, we're 50-50 partners. They have a stake in it, we have a stake in it. And I can tell you, we always don't get along. So <laughs> the, the WTA is, acts as a kind of a, a referee sometimes there. Um, I, I'm jealous of the PGA Tour's uh, ability to help on a local level with sponsorships, um, really try and push and, and do some team building and do some best practices. And I would say I'm trying to bring that to the WTA tours where they don't do a great job of that, trying to go down that path a little bit more where they're helping us with some branding, helping us with some relationships. Um, I think the PGA Tour has done a great job on that front and continues to mature probably faster than most of us um, from a professional organization. Um, and we're a global event uh, like, like PGA Tour is. Um, we have tournaments in 52 different countries. Um, so all communicating, all being on the same page isn't the easiest of tasks. So our, our leader, the CEO of the WTA Tour, Steve Simon, has done a great job of making sure we're all on the same page, bringing us together, making sure there's one message throughout the year for the tour. Um, but I still think we have a long way to go on that front as well. So, Kerry, talk about your relationship with NASCAR and what it means. Well, NASCAR is the sanctioning body for, for the sport. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. I worked for NASCAR for 12 years, okay? And I used to, to and, and, and sometimes I would get frustrated with the tracks and, and, the, and, and the track promoters. And now that I'm on the other side of the <laughs> fence, uh, I don't think NASCAR is as smart as I used to think they were. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, they're the sanctioning body of, uh, of, of stock car racing in North America. And in, in, in our sport, it's kind of interesting because you have um, International Speedway Corporation, uh, which is out of Daytona, uh, which is the, the public side of NASCAR and owns about 12 racetracks, of, of which one is Darlington. Then you have Speedway Motorsports, uh, which is uh, out of Charlotte, uh, uh, that owns Charlotte and Texas and Las Vegas and the Bruton Smith's uh, company. And then you have some private tracks like Pocono and Indianapolis is owned by the George family and uh, 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 Dover is, is, is a private. So it's a little different, uh, you know, we really, everybody, you know, falls under the NASCAR umbrella, but then everybody is out there really just trying to uh, you know, work together, coexist, and put on the best possible event that you can. But NASCAR obviously um, provides us with the ability to, to, to put on our event. Uh, it's it's kind of like a traveling circus. Uh, to be quite honest with you, about 36 race weekends a year. I just came from Martinsville. They're going to be at Texas this weekend, then they go to Bristol. And so every single week, it's, uh, it's, it's something different. You know, NASCAR really doesn't have home teams. Uh, or you, don't, you don't play home games, uh, and, and you just go from track to track, and everybody gets their favorite driver, and, you know, they boo Kyle Busch, and, and they pull for, <laughs> for, they pull for, uh, for uh, uh, Junior, who's not racing anymore, but uh, he is racing at Darlington on Saturday, though, so I expect everybody to come out of Darlington <laughs> right. on Saturday this year. But it, it's kind of a unique uh, situation, kind of different than, 
than, uh, than Steve and Bob's uh, 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 sanctity uh, bodies. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, politics involved uh, that, you, that you have to kind of uh, weave your way through. But, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and I think NASCAR is, is probably, um, I'd say 10 years ago, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago, was, was kind of seeing where they wanted to go uh, with some certain things. Uh, I'd say over the last two years, particularly this past year, I think, I think the leadership has been outstanding. We just came out with our uh, 2020 schedule today. Very, very exciting news for Darlington. Uh, we're still on Labor Day in 2020. We're also going to be the lead race for the uh, playoffs, the first race going into the playoffs, which is very, very exciting for the entire state. So um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different dynamic uh, than, than maybe uh, uh, PGA and, and the WT had. WTA has, but uh, it's uh, all all good. Everybody's just trying to put on the best events that they can. The PGA. Well, <laughs> it's actually PGA Tour. PGA Wait, Tour. Yeah, where's PGA. Kim? Right. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's that's a unique thing well, too. Well, actually, go ahead. Tell P difference with the PGA Tour and, and the PGA yeah, of America. Exactly. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, yeah, the P the PGA there the PGA of America is professional golfers, where the PGA Tour mm -hmm. are are. How did I just say that again, too? You're, the PGA is your, your golf professionals, where the PGA Tour is tour professionals, and they're the professional golfers. So when we, have the, we talk to PGA, which is, will be coming in 2021 to, uh, mm -hmm. to Kiowa, and that's the PGA of America, where who we work with, associate with, is the PGA Tour um, which is based in Ponte Vedra. Uh, they actually have seven tours internationally and all too, but uh, there's 45 events on the PGA Tour that we are a part of. So there are two different organizations. Um, I'd first like to compliment both of these gentlemen. I've learned a lot from them over the years and the efforts that they've put forth too. And, uh, you know, Bob in, in trying to change the tune or the tone a little bit with uh, family, uh, with, with tennis and WTA too, because Again, it's about best practices. We're, we're trying to create something in, in racing and PGA Tour that is trying to complement golf. So if, we, if, if something is, happens in San Diego at the uh, Farmers and we take something good from that, it's, it's growing the game, but it's also growing uh, things for, 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 for us. Uh, the organization itself is independent. Um, they're all independent contractors, the professionals, so we actually do not know what we're getting every week. And that's where I compliment um, NASCAR in a way, because when we went down that path a few years ago, as I mentioned, we had some, we had some sponsors that were teed up wanting to be a part of things, but they were also wanting to see players each week. And where there's no guarantees of that, where that's where a lot of these partners ended up, or potential partners looked at at NASCAR because they knew what they were getting each week. They knew the players they were getting. Now you can see from the sponsors what RBC's done. They're fully engaged. They've done it a different way. They've gone out and created these ambassadors. Uh, uh, Zurich has done it now. Um, Travelers has done it now too. So they've done it a, a different way with some of these players. But uh, um, but again, it's uh, it's the organization itself gives us total support from entertainment to operations commit we we obviously sell an event but there is also a sales team within the, the PGA tour that assists us uh, from tournament business affairs from the, the, the television all aspects we are we're fully engaged with the PGA tour on a daily basis that supports the efforts of the Heritage Classic Foundation and our tournament so okay yeah so tell me what's in, in today's terms what's your um, think about the millennials so generation X Y and Z you know, golf, of course, nationally faces the issue that they typically don't want to spend five to six hours out of the day. Now, granted, that's your core product, not what you sell, but at the same time, related to that, applying to that, your, you know, your event is six hours a day, roughly. You're three to four hours. You're, depending on how many matches, it can be as All long day. as that. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you engage that millennial person, uh, or, do you do, or is, it, is it the way you create other things around the event? Or is it that you just want them for a part of time of that? You don't have them as long in the seats, maybe? Tell me a little bit of how that's changed over the years. I think you're, you're spot on. We are trying to figure out multiple ways to deliver the product, the product being the on-court experience. And we got to speed it up because we know we have to. All of us are probably thinking that way. Uh, this is the first year that our tournament will actually have a shot clock. 
um, that's engaged okay. in every match. So they, they can't, uh, a player has to serve within 25 seconds uh, to move it along. Uh, we're looking at all kinds of different opportunities to speed things up uh, because we know the, uh, that, that window for a millennial is probably a little bit shorter than what it was 10 to 15 years ago. So we're constantly looking at product, and then also how do we deliver that product? Uh, via streaming, phone, your, your iPad, anything we can, all of our product that we have from a match perspective, you can, you can be delivered on any device that you have. So yeah, we're, how do we make the product a little bit more manageable? How do we make it a little bit faster? And then how do we deliver that product? So again, in that side, someone might not wanna watch a match for two and a half to three hours, but they might wanna see clips so we're doing a much better job of saying, hey, you may not watch the match, but we're going to provide you with the highlights of that match very, very quickly behind that match. So people can actually tune in and say, I just want to see the highlights. We're providing that. So multiple different ways we're trying to have an effect on that, uh, on that generation. Got Kerry? I think um, for, for us at Darlington, I think the, the, the thing that, that, that we try to do and, and, and try to emphasize is we want you to come to the event. Okay, we want you to experience the event. You know, even if you don't like NASCAR, I was telling Steve earlier today, he asked me about, you know, how I got into NASCAR. Well, I'll be honest with you, I worked in college sports 26 years, and then I got a phone call one day from a guy who was the vice president of NASCAR I'd gone to school with, wanted to know, after we had several different conversations, if I was going to leave college sports, could come work at NASCAR. I said, well, I don't even like NASCAR. <laughs> I said, it comes on TV, I don't even watch it. He said, come down to Daytona and then let me know. So I went to Daytona. This is in 2005, the old Bush race, Bush series. Spent about eight hours there. Came back to Columbia. My wife said, what did you, what did you think? I said, I don't know what I saw, but it was cool. <laughs> and so what we try to do is get people to the event. We have a very robust college outreach program, okay? And the university here does a super job with it. We're also at College of Charleston, Coastal Carolina. We try to get up to Clemson, but they have to go to school on Monday uh, and I, because I think they need to, right? They, they, they got to try to catch up with you all. But uh, no reporters in there, I hope, right? Okay. But uh, so we get about 1,800 college students. We have a college zone. We have entertainment uh, and, 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 and the like, and we bring drivers out there. We had a driver last year. We brought Clint Boyer out to the college zone. He almost missed driver introductions uh, because he didn't want to leave. But now what we want to try to do is once you leave college, we want to be able to, to communicate to those folks that are right out of college, getting their first paychecks, and, and, and make it affordable to them to come back to the race. That's the group that I think NASCAR really needs to focus on. Because you come in, when you're a college kid, you come with your fraternity, your, your, your Greek life, and you have a great time and so forth, but then you get that first job. And, you know, you're making a little money and you got a little money in your pocket. You know, where are you going to spend the discretionary money? That's the group that we really need to focus on. And, and we've been doing a lot of things, a lot of analytical studies and so forth with uh, the folks down in Daytona to try to help us with that. Because, I, I, and I will, I'll be honest with you, once we can get that, that person to come back a second or third time, I tell you what, they, they start coming back. Even if you don't really are, a, if you're not even a car enthusiast, because it's just the experience. I mean, you, you, you see everything. It's, and if you can get, get them to the, to the track a couple of times, it's, it's, I think you, you got something there. Steve, a little bit about the, particularly, you know, I've been involved in the tournament for eight years now, and what's changed like the Heritage Village now, for example, around 17, 18 there. Talk a little bit about how that engages some of the younger millennial group and the things that you're doing now. Well, it's, I think you all here heard that term, FOMO fear of missing out. And it really is, um, we're, we're unique, somewhat like uh, Bob with tennis. We're, we're 18 holes. We, you, you, can't, you can follow a group, but you're going to miss the action elsewhere. So what do we do to engage all these spectators there, certainly those, those wanting, wanting the, the action now? And that's where we create the, the Heritage Lawn, it was in support. We've actually lost space because the networks got bigger, so we moved CBS and we've created a new area. We have wine at nine. We have the, um, the craft beer garden now. We've, uh, we continue to do things around the tournament so that we can get exactly what Kerry's saying. We, we want these people coming to 
the, certainly the fraternity and sororities coming down, but after that first job when they're 30, 35 coming down and, and then staying around. Once, once they're in, we hopefully can get them there, but we have to create things around the experience of just coming to a golf tournament. And uh, so we continue, we, we continue to learn, we continue to look at things. We're, we're limited in with space and we're looking at d trying to create things to go up because we have a unique footprint as well that we continue to have our challenges with the tour. We're contractually obligated every year to raise our purse $200,000. Um, so how do, how do we do that? So we're looking for new, new, new revenue opportunities. So we look at all these things from We'll take from I'll take from Bob. I'll take from Kerry some ideas, and hopefully ones sure. we could use too. So it's uh, it's it's ever changing. That's for sure. Okay, we'll finish with a couple of sort of short answer um, questions. Sort of uh, your thoughts on this. So, other than weather, the week of the tournament or the day of the tournament, as the case may be, what keeps you up at night? What do you go to bed at night worrying about the next day? Well, other than, I know weather's a big issue for all three, <laughs> but other than weather, what is it? Bob, we'll start with you. Uh, talent. The, the players. The uh, players. The players, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're in a very physical sport. So um, for us, and I'm going through that right now, is we're, the players are two weeks in Indian Wells out in California on hard courts, then two more weeks in Miami on hard courts, and then they come to Charleston. Um, that's four weeks away from home, four weeks in pretty, you know, right now both Indian Wells and Miami have been very hot, so the players are tired. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, are they just out of gas? And we have to deal with that. So what's my messaging to the, to the community and saying we got a great field coming and then I lose a player or lose another player because they're simply tired um, or worn out. Um, that's where the physicality of tennis kind of, it's an unknown for me. So weather's an unknown and the player health and player ability to be at my event is an unknown. Got you. Gary, what keeps you up at night? Well, certainly all three of us are, are uh, weather is so paramount. Uh, you know, we had um, two years ago when I first got there, we had a, a tropical storm come through on a Friday. We had to shut the racetrack down. And they didn't even give it a good name. It was Hermine or something like that, <laughs> tropical storm Hermine. Um, last year, uh, we had just started the driver introductions, and we had lightning, a lightning alert. Mm. alert. Not only one, but two. Uh, and, uh, you know, so... So weather is the one, and then I think probably the other thing that, that is, is, not that it keeps me up, but it is now just part of our, it's part of the world, and it's just, you know, fan security and safety. We are both at large, large venues with thousands of thousands of people, with national TV audiences, and, uh, you know, Times have changed, and it's and it's and it's sad, but it's reality. And so, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, put the the the, the safety uh, and well-being of your fans at the at the forefront. Uh, and yet, you you want to put on an event that is fan friendly. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, those things have times have changed, and so. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a little different world out there now. And uh, I think, I, not that it keeps me up, but I think it's got, got my radar up, big time, big time radar sure. up, so. Steve, to hear You know, uh, Kerry's spot on. It's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that we're talk, talking about the, from mm -hmm. the security mm -hmm. side. Uh, we have festivals, we have a race, we have tent, tents, we have golf. This would be something, but to, to know Ten years ago, we never even really talked security. Uh, the Boston Marathon, the, uh, the unfortunate circumstances up there was the Monday of our tournament a few years ago, and everything has certainly changed. And uh, I wasn't going to say security, but it was well, it's know, really I, something that is, it's, yeah. it's, 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 you have to look at it. We have a unique footprint, too, is that we have a 1,000 access points to that golf tournament. We don't have one way in or one way out. So... That is something that I wasn't going to comment because I was going to talk about player, players and Mother Nature as well, the two things you have no control over. But, um, um, but that is probably something that's uh, without question right up there. Yeah, and not, again, not that you, you just lament over it. Right. But it's something, I think, that, that you, you, you better be buttoned up. Uh, you, you, your, your EAP 
uh, better be better be ready to roll, uh, and, and because you know things can happen, and uh, you know that's that's I guess that's probably maybe the thing that maybe has changed uh, changed uh, the the way that you you approach things. Uh, uh, I feel very confident that we have a very safe uh, environment uh, at the track. Uh, I really do. Uh, and I'm sure Steve and Bob feel the exactly the same way. Uh, when I go down to his tournament here in a few weeks, I will be completely relaxed and, and, and laid back. Uh, uh, trust me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, think, like I said, it's just the way the world is. And, uh, you know, I, I think all of us uh, spend a lot of time thinking and planning about things like that that, like you said, 10 years ago was, was not really on our checklist. Uh, just a, a comment there. Th two, three years ago, we all do military events in some way, shape, or form. Uh, this year was the first time I had an action team from uh, the air base come out and actually needed a two to three hour walkthrough on all of our safety concerns, all our security concerns, where the active military and their families will be sitting. Uh, they went through a food process. What foods will, be, will they be eating and who will they be eating them from? And they wanted to walk through of our kitchens. That two to three years ago wasn't even a process. So yeah, to, to echo both thoughts, it is definitely uh, top of mind on all of our- So security is that, that one thing asked other than weather is a right. really big thing. Mm -hmm. So we'll end, end my questions on a sort of a fun note. So tell me your greatest experience of your event since you've been involved with it. What happened and what was it or what, was, <laughs> what really is, sticks out in your mind if somebody says, of your career, the, whether your, your particular uh, organization or event, what took place that sticks out in your mind is one you'll be telling the grandkids about for a long time. And I'll start, Carrie, well, I'll start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess it was my first race at Darlington. And I'd worked at NASCAR for 12 years and I'd, during my previous job, I was uh, director of communications, and I would go to probably 26, 27 races a year. Uh, I've been to every track, and, 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 and during the course of my time, and, and, and Jack Mills, my good friend, I'd see him at the track all the time. But I was always engaged and knew exactly what was going on on the track. You know, I knew who was in the garage. I knew who was winning. I knew who was leading. I knew who was the fastest. You know, I'd be working the media center, I'd be up in the press box, I'd, if someone got hurt, I'd go down to the care center. So I was totally focused on, you know, what was evolving with the race. So my first year at Darlington, uh, Chip Wow, my predecessor, had, had told me uh, early on, he said, uh, now, you won't get to see much of the race. He said, because you'll be all over, and he kind of gave me a checklist of places to go. and. Uh, he was right. I, uh, I, I, I was all over the place that day. I was up in the stands. I was in the concession uh, areas. I wanted to see where, you know, where we had bottlenecks with lines. Uh, I was in the care center making sure that everything was going well there. I went to the press box, go to all the suites, go to the garage, go to pit road, uh, sit up in the stands. I sit up in the stands for like 20 laps up in up in Tyler Tower, wondering how these people can even get up there, right? <laughs> this is before we put in the new seats. And so uh, my, my communications director is frantically trying to get me on the radio with about 30 laps to go. He goes, you got to present the trophy. you got to come to Victory Lane. And so I get down there, and I had no idea who was winning the race. <laughs> They had to tell me who won the race, so I would give the trophy out to the right person. So I guess that just maybe, it, it, you know, when, when, you, when you put on an event like this, you, you got to wear a lot of different hats, and, and uh, we, 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 we certainly do that. But I guess that's probably, you know, the one story that, 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 I, that stands out in my mind. Just, you know, when, you, when you're on this side of it, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, different things that you have to, you know, pay attention to. Good story. Steve, what was your one moment that stands out? Uh, you know, there, there, there are many, but one in, in kind of ties in, you know, we talk about our health being so important and family and then the fact that uh, all this other stuff we'll figure out. But I'll never forget the, um, and I think about it, it ties a lot of the things I just mentioned into. It was um, Davis Love had won the event. It was, um, uh, he was on the 18th, received the trophy, and there was a, eight, nine-year-old boy that was there, and he had asked if, if it would be okay for him to go with him to the interview room and all these things, and this boy 
goes with them and goes into the locker room with them and proceeds to go into the media center and sits with them while he's in the media. And, um, and all of a sudden, the, um, the media picked up on the fact that how great is it that Davis Love is enjoying this with his son. That was my son. <laughs> and uh, and I, I kind of said, because he, he, he kind of took him away because he knew, and everyone's like, how great is that? But I remember that because that ties in the, uh, um, the, the fact of the hard work that's put forth, the, the, the efforts that are put on, and, uh, hmm. and we're 24-7, as we all know, let alone not just that week, but throughout the, um, several weeks. But that ties, uh, that was a story that I'll never forget. That's special. Bob? I'm glad I got to go third. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, it was it was one of those days that was a result of a bad day, which is we had some weather issues the first couple of days, and putting the schedule together for the the next day. There's a lot of fear that went through me when you have to go to Serena Williams and Venus Williams, <laughs> and tell them that they they both have to play twice on Ooh. the same day. Ouch! And both of them who told me that they haven't done that in like 10 to 15 years. Um, but what it turned out to be, we had weather problems. You know, anytime you have weather problems, you usually paying money back or taking a hit in the checkbook. But to put out a, a schedule for the day that was Serena Williams in match one, Venus Williams in match two, Serena Williams again in match three, and Venus Williams in match four was a pretty special day for all of our fans. And turned out to be a home run with walk-up sales, and and the girls actually embraced it when it was all said and done. They they actually had to play the, each other the next day. Um, but so, that, they, so they won. <laughs> they both won. They, they both made it through, and um, it was just you know one of those things you're never going to create again. It's never going to happen again. Um, so that was a very cool experience for, for not just me but all our fans too. It was very fun. Yeah. Super. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. We've got a little time left, and so uh, I'll open it up. Uh, just raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Yes, sir, right here. I'm obviously not a student, but curious. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned throwback, and, and maybe everybody here doesn't know exactly just how much that means. What a big thing that is. We're the only sport that goes back and right. does that. The drivers plan from one year to the next what they're going to look like. Right? right. And it's far be it from me to tell you who's one of the best talkers I've ever seen to say that, but say a little more about throwback. Sure. About four or five years ago, Darlington was able to get its Labor Day race back. And so uh, the powers that be at ISC, uh, and several others said, you know what, we should come up with some type of a hook uh, that, that makes Darlington unique. And they came up with this throwback platform. And what that is, it's kind of like retro paint schemes, uh, drivers and teams wear throwback uniforms. You know, you see that in other sports where the Steelers might have a throwback jersey on one, one time or, or, or the Yankees, but, but they do it the whole weekend, okay? and we celebrate different eras, okay? This year we're doing 90 to 94, and somebody might say, well, that's not very long ago. Well, it is about 30 years ago, okay? <laughs> and, and so, but we don't limit, we don't limit uh, the teams on what they do uh, from a paint scheme standpoint. We say, hey, you know, whatever is relevant, whatever is cool for you, you do it, okay? Uh, Dale Jr. is gonna race our race uh, uh, on, on Saturday, the Xfinity race. He could have raced anywhere he wanted to, obviously. He's only racing one time this year, and it's going to be Saturday at Darlington. And his direct quote was, the throwback platform is so cool, I couldn't miss it. <laughs> and so it, 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 we bring back Hall of Famers, we bring back legends, and we beco it, it becomes a reunion, okay? It becomes a reunion. And we brought back drivers last year, that hadn't been back to the to, to the racetrack and since they left, and uh, a lot of them come up to me and they just said, "I want to thank you for inviting me." They said, "You know, we didn't know if we were supposed to come back. We didn't have a real reason to come back, and so it's really becoming a reunion uh, for the sport. And what better time to have a reunion than Labor Day, right? You got Monday off." So uh, it, it's, it's, really, it, it's really worked out well for us uh, uh, to, to have that throwback platform. And, you know, you get, you get some of these teams like the Wood Brothers, which many of you all probably have never heard of, but they're the oldest team out there. And they're already, they, they've been working on their throwback car since January. <laughs> and so it's just something that allows us, again, to stay relevant 12 months a year. 
uh, because people are always wanting to, you know, what are you going to run at Darlington? You know, what, what are you wearing at Darlington? And so it's, it's really kind of a, of a neat thing. Other questions from the audience? Yes, sir, right in the third row. You spoke about Bojangles wanting a, like, year-round sponsorship. Mm -hmm. um, has Volvo or RBC kind of expressed that in themselves? And if so, how do, how do you help them get a year-round sponsorship? Steve, you want to go first? Yeah, actually, it's interesting that Kerry was talking about how NASCAR is kind of going that way because that's how the tour, uh, one of the reasons RBC is a, one of our partners is the fact that Boeing is there. And the reason Boeing is there is because RBC is there. And you'll see more, more of that, um, I think, out there than, mm -hmm. uh, um, than the norm. Um, and that's to help support uh, the efforts. You know, we have two incredible companies working together, let alone the likes of many others. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, from, from that side, it's, it's, uh, it's important staying engaged, creating relationships, and keeping it fresh. I mean, that's something, the last thing we certainly want to see is uh, uh, a potential sponsor or title in this case, too, saying, okay, been there, done that, and time to go somewhere else. So we continue to tr work with... Um, all our partners, obviously, but certainly the title RBC that ha has all the television time and Boeing, that's a, a tremendous partner too of working with them, um, you know, to enhance their experience and keep them around for a long time to come as well. Bob, you want to talk about Volvo? Sure. So, great question, and you know, these guys can't hire you yet. I'm still waiting on you, okay? <laughs> um, Volvo came to us actually uh, last year and said, you know what, we, we love what the week is, but how do we expand that? And easiest way for us to expand that is through media and, and social media. So we went to Tennis Channel, which we broadcast um, our full week on, and said, okay, WTA season starts in January. Uh, how do we start doing some stuff with Volvo in January that's showcasing what they're doing with us starting in January, running all the way through April? Um, and then we're also looking at how do we expand it afterwards and constant conversation. So, yeah, always looking to not just focus on that week, but how do we focus that relationship year-round? Um, we're getting better and better at that, but this year we really engaged in at least January through April, and now we're looking at how to do it post the event as well. Great question. Question from the audience. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, Mr. Wilmot, um, I have a question. Uh, how has the construction of the new clubhouse uh, affected the tournament? Actually, the question was about the, the clubhouse, and actually it was a commitment that the, uh, the new clubhouse, this will be the fourth year, will actually be, be in it. But uh, um, Sea Pines, that is owned by the Riverstone Group, it also owns Kiwa, um, uh, the ocean, uh, the, the, the public facilities there. It's, uh, um, it, it's tr the, the assets of the facilities certainly has helped, but the one thing that we run into, again, too, the, these players, um, they're not, we, we, we would love for them to come every year, um, but they're also, uh, you know, I've been around long enough too that these, these players are coming due to their schedules, due to do the, how they play a golf course and some other things and how they're feeling too. But we also got to realize that they, a, a player is, um, becomes engaged, married, has kids and things too, and they're not going to be there. So the facilities without question help but it's certainly not guaranteeing players to, to come each year. But uh, um, what the Sea Pines has done to, to enhance the event has truly been tremendous. So. Other questions? Anybody in the back there? Nope. Closing comments, gentlemen. Um, Bob, I'll start with you. Uh, number one, it's been a pleasure, and thank you. It's been a pleasure to share the stage with Kerry and Steve. Steve and I have known each other for 20 years. Um, and little, little known fact is we worked really hard. And Dwayne, you've been part of that to make sure we're not on the same week. Yes. Um, you know, the beginning of it in, on Daniel Allen and Charles, and we shared the same week, which was not a pleasant experience for either one of us. But um, it's been an honor to, to sit in front of this group and, and to share the stage with, with Kerry and Steve. Steve's mentioned it many times. We all need to keep learning. And I learned a lot from these two gentlemen tonight, and uh, I greatly, greatly appreciate the opportunity. Gary? Again, I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Reagan for this opportunity. It's a real honor uh, to be here uh, to, at, a, at a university that I truly love uh, and, and worked here for 20 years. I see my friend, good friend there, Sid, and, and his wife, Lynn. Uh, but um, 
you know, just a, just a word to the students that are here. Um, you know, you, you, the opportunity that you have provide or have been provided here at the university is is awesome. Uh, take advantage of it. Uh, this is this is the about the best program in the country uh, that you're involved with here, and, and and you have three resources here to draw upon. Okay. Uh, two in the spring and one in the fall, and they're all different. Okay, trust me, I haven't been to his event, but I'm going to go. <laughs> okay, and um, uh, take advantage of what you have in this state. Uh, get involved, volunteer, uh, and 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 you'd be surprised uh, that once you do that, I, I think that that you would really have a great insight. And then I would encourage you to talk to your friends. Uh, about these events. Spread the word. You could be ambassadors for all, all three of our events up here. So, uh, you know, take advantage of what, what this program here uh, has provided you and, uh, you know, you'd be surprised at some of the contacts and connections you can make uh, at these events. Jerry's spot on, without, without, without question. Dr. Regan, thank you, the university. Dwayne, thank you for your certainly continuing support. And uh, again, I'm, I'm honored. I had chilled up seeing these two gentlemen today, you know, and uh, I'd be sharing the stage with them today. But uh, I, I, again, um, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we're very fortunate to have these events in this wonderful state of South Carolina, and uh, uh, which is truly home to, to so many. And I'm a, I'm a Southern RV and from South Jersey, but this is home, <laughs> I can tell you. I can, I can tell you, so, but, uh, but thank you again. Yeah, and I'd like to personally thank all each of you coming, faculty, students, and other attendees who are here tonight. And I certainly, please join me in giving a hand to these three gentlemen up here. Who've been here. Um, Dr. Regan, I, I want to say one, you know, as a graduate of the University of South Carolina, I attended my first heritage actually while I was here at the campus. So, Yes, you can drive to Hilton Head and come back. I Absolutely. promise. I've done it, and I still graduated. So, so I, I, you know, these these are wonderful. I've been all three of these on numerous occasions. Um, they truly are great experiences. Our state is blessed to have in our state. And so, and last, I'll finish up. Thank you, Dr. Regan, for inviting me and the others here as well tonight. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, you know thank Dr. Brown, our chair, and Dino for you know allowing me to get some of this some of these things done, but. When I take a look at it, when I was thinking about putting something together, um, I've known you all for quite a while. And the, I can remember the very first time when we were down at the family circle, or the Volvo at the family circle at the time, and you were competing, and you know, Jim McEwen was, this has got to end, and we have all these things going together. And Mike Lawrence and I were talking with Jim and Lisa, and there wasn't a very nice meeting, and there was words. And I can remember Jim walking out, and he said, you know, we're moving. And Jim walks out, and he says to me, he said, Tom, I don't know where the hell we're going. He says, but I want to stay in South Carolina. And I was like, really? Because we had bids from other places, and you, you know. And then that was the first time that kind of put in my, in my mind that, you know, he loved South Carolina. So then when I come here, and there's a gentleman comes in, he's, you know, where do you smoke? Well, Jim Hunter. And he, I said, we, we don't smoke in here. And he said, you mind? I said, no, Jim, I really don't care. I, my dad smoked, and you can smoke in here. It's fine with me. Well, Winston used to sponsor NASCAR. <laughs> so then he goes, um, have you ever been to NASCAR? And you, can you do an economic study? I said, yeah, I did the Broncos. He goes, you ever been? I said, no. I said, left turns, whatever. He goes, <laughs> and he put me in the Colvin Grandstand on the steel. These guys are dressed up like Rusty Wallace, and the people in front are Dale Earnhardt, and she has number threes painted on her fingernails. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> well, they started around that lap, and that tingle went up my spine, and I said, this kid from Montana looks going to love this sport. And, I'm, and to this day, I still do. And I can remember, you know, Steve, when we're, you know, you go out to the Heritage, and we're there. And I can remember people, and I was, you know, sitting there talking to him. and I said, where are you from? He said, you know, I'm from... This one was from Nebraska, and I said, how about you? And he said, well, I'm from Illinois. I said, why are you here? He goes, why wouldn't we be here? And I'm like, well, he's looking at, they were standing by the tree there, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. 
And I mean, you, you can just see. And we have, when I was thinking about putting this together, and, and Dwayne, I was, you know, I really appreciate you doing this, but you've known all these, and the business that takes care of between, you have to support them, and they need your support. And what I want to do is that we always look for new things. We always look for new events. We're always looking for whatever. But you got to take care of the ones that are the great events. And these are three great events. And you name me another state that has what this has right here, and you're hard pressed to come up with it. That's a trivia question for my class on Friday when I give them a quiz. So, but uh, when you think about it, you got the WTA, NASCAR, and you got the PGA sitting here in a fairly small state. And I mean, in, why else would you go to Darlington? No, oh, trust me. I mean, <laughs> I, mean it, I live there. I mean, it, <laughs> but you sit there and take a look at it. It's not Charleston, you know. And then when you get there in Hilton Head, it's a beautiful place. But I, when I put this, was thinking about this. I think you guys got great events, but you guys are great leaders. And what you've done, you've shown over the years how you've maintained this and the support of the state. And that's why I thought of you other than your son paid me to bring you in. <laughs> but, uh, and then on top of that, we have some gifts. If you, Gianna, you will come up here and help me, all right? Well, the, we're gonna get a picture of these things and here's what they look like and I expect, I expect them to be in your offices, all right? <laughs> when I come visit, so. Steve. Thank you. This one is a little bit different. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. And then we even have one for the boss. There the we boss go. This year. Thank you very Boy, much. There you go. So Thank you. Cool. Those Thank are you much. They're gifts that we do, and um, you know, each of you, we're going to get a picture of you. And then, uh, is there? I really appreciate you all coming. Um, this is, uh, you know, an opportunity that we have to share your knowledge with the students in the community of Carolina, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.